church. I hope that everyone is keeping safe and dry and warm on this crazy wet and chilly weekend and I also hope that the sound of pouring rain does not come through on the video. <laughs> Um, my name's Holly Marsden. Some of you may recognise me from last week's service where um, I chatted alongside Faith Young um, about the, the alpha course for young adults that we've been running for the last nine weeks, I think. Um, and that video or that chat is actually the reason that I'm sitting here chatting to you guys today um, because in the grand tradition of CHS you say yes to one thing and then you find yourself doing many many other things that are um, a bit out of your comfort zone but here I am. Um, before I share today's notices um, I just I, I really feel that God has put something on my heart um, specifically since um, filming that video that we, um, yeah, that we, where we chatted about and reported back on Alpha. And yeah, I, I really wanted to kind of come back to that topic and specifically look at the Holy Spirit weekend that we had, because one aspect that we didn't chat about is how difficult Alpha's been um, in this online context. And please don't get me wrong, it's been incredible and all those things we said are true. It's It's been a joyful, incredible experience of learning and growing as this awesome group of people. And yeah, it's been an incredible space. Um, but as with everything, it has been challenging. And yeah, this whole online aspect to it has added many more dimensions of challenge. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of look at that and share with the church um, how I've experienced that and just how God, as he always does, has used that challenge and that difficulty and, and yeah, just brought forward some amazing and encouraging things for me. Um, yeah, so that weekend, um, the Holy Spirit weekend away, as much as you can have a weekend away um, in the current circumstances, was basically just a Saturday um, of connecting online after a pretty <laughs> tricky week of varsity um, for me, a humanities student, and especially for those of us leaders doing um, um, more, yeah, doing science degrees. <laughs> um, yeah, we, it was also a weekend um, much like this one, raining, storming, windy, and I don't really know how Wi-Fi and everything works and please don't laugh if this makes no sense but um, the connection was terrible maybe because of that um, or everyone's Wi-Fi and cell connection was just very funky and it made connecting online very difficult um, people were dropping dropping off calls and and yeah it was just really hard especially when everything we do is online and um, yeah, the, the whole core of, of Alpha that we learn from is um, these videos which need to be downloaded and then these conversations which take up a lot of data and yeah, that that's where a lot of the learning happening, uh, learning happens and um, if we can't connect then yeah, it's really tricky and it excludes a lot of people which is hard and so we're already dealing with those issues in the morning and um, I think I can speak for most of us when uh, in saying that we were exhausted and we had um, a first morning session and then we broke off for lunch and after that morning session I was so drained and I think everyone was. We find every alpha, alpha session very draining and that I'm, I'm sure those of you who've been doing online calls just know that particular kind of exhaustion after you've done an online call. So we'd already had that morning. Um, we came back after lunch pretty tired and some people didn't come back after lunch some of the people taking part in alpha which was really discouraging um there were probably many different reasons behind it but yeah it, it was quite tricky and i remember thinking like like this is how is this gonna work not only am i tired not only is the the wi-fi connection terrible but now we have to have this intense holy spirit encounter and prayer online how does that work does 
does the Holy Spirit even work online? And this is a question that I actually have come across quite a lot um, in my different kind of meetings and church online experiences. Like, how does the Holy Spirit work online? But what I want to kind of say this morning is um, I, w- I want to testify that the Holy Spirit completely does work online the holy spirit is at work online um and and i have experienced the, experienced this in different ways but that that afternoon where we met and went into small groups and prayed and we were praying in these weird circumstances with people praying with people that i'd never met and for people that i'd never met um in a zoom breakout room i experienced the holy spirit so powerfully and after feeling really dry myself just having that overflow of holy spirit as i was praying for for other people was just incredible and so encouraging and yeah so i just i want to share um this morning that the holy spirit is at work and god is at work despite our circumstances despite um, me, despite my doubts, my exhaustion, my anxiety, um, the Holy Spirit was at work and is at work in my life. Despite us as the church and the challenges that we're going through, God is at work. And despite our circumstances, both as a church in this pandemic and and the country and the economy, God is at work. God works despite God works despite me, despite us, despite our circumstances. So that's just what I really wanted to share um, this morning and what I really feel that God has been putting on my heart for a long time, but I just specifically feel very encouraged in that um, this this week and today. So going from that, I have some notices to share for the church. Um, First, If you are feeling unwell and feel like you may have um, contracted COVID-19, please get in contact with Lynn Fritos or um, the church office so that our health team at the church can keep in touch with you. Um, Secondly, secondly, in our YouTube series, oh, YouTube series, (laughs) the church has left the building this week. we have Katie, Ware, oh, Katie Wade sharing her experiences of being a professional healthcare worker in Kailicha during the pandemic. You can find this video on our um, Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. And also um, Katie and her husband Tim have contracted COVID this week. Um, so yeah, we'd really ask you just to keep them in your prayers. Um, going forward this week. Finally, this is just a reminder of the weekly prayer meeting that is held at 7.30 p.m. on a Monday on Zoom. Um, For um, the meeting link and any other details of notices or contact details, um, please contact the church office or look at our WhatsApp group. Okay, next, um, after this, we'll be hearing from Um, Reverend Tabang from uh, St John's Church. Um, He's going to be interviewed by Brendan and then he'll be sharing a sermon with us. Um, But before we go into that, I would just like to open this service in prayer. Father, thank you so much that you work despite what is going on, Lord. Thank you that despite the incredibly challenging circumstances that we are under despite um the fact that church looks so different and and it can be hard to find a sense of of community online lord you work despite this lord i pray that um that yeah that you will use this space this morning to encourage us that you will encourage us with your holy spirit and and help us to really have a sense of of the ways that you are working um, and the ways that you are supporting each of us, Lord. Um, I pray that, yeah, that your your word will speak clearly to us and that we will just have an amazing sense of you. Amen.
very pleased to have uh, Tabang with us today. Um, he said he has to behave now. We've been chatting for a while, sorting out all the church issues, but now he has to behave. Um, so thanks so much for uh, joining us today, Tabang. Tabang is going to be uh, preaching um, as we continue our series in uh, the book of Revelation today. But um, he's only recently started at St. John's. Um, um, him and Kwezi, was it January? When did you start? We started on the 1st of December. 1st of December. Oh, so it's been a while and then straight into lockdown. So it's been quite a challenge to lead a church in that space. Um, but I thought it'd be really good um, just for us to get to know Tabang a little bit and hear about him and Kwezi and uh, how they've been finding it at St. John's because not many of us know them. Um, so Tabang, um, <laughs> tell us a little bit of your, your and Kwezi stories. Where, where are you guys from? How did you end up here? Wow, okay. Yo, it's a long story. But yeah, good morning, and I'm very excited to be here and be part of the service at CHS. So yeah, well, I come from Polokwane, uh, formerly known as Petersburg, born in 1981. Difficult years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was raised by grandparents and then eventually moved in with my mom and stepdad. And yeah, grew up in Polokwane basically all my life. And I joined the military after matric. <laughs> before oh. before uh, the military, I did a year of, of IT. I didn't enjoy that. And I joined the military. And uh, yeah, I was in the military for six years. In the military, I qualified as an electronics mechanician. My trade, I was an electronics combat weapon fitter. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then I've always had a calling to go into ministry. And I thought when I joined the army, I would go just for two years to do, you know, uh, my military skills development as it was. We were the first group of military skills, skills development in 2003. And I got to stay on longer because I studied electronics and I, I really enjoyed it. Eventually, I went to theological college with the Salvation Army in Bramfontein. And that's where I met Kwezi. Ah. Kwezi actually came as a, uh, like an intern before she went into college. So I met her there. She became a friend, a little sister. Eventually I was ordained in 2010 and I got appointed to her church in Nongoma where she comes from. Okay. And yeah, and she was now my student in college who I had to look after. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, the friendship grew and blossomed and yeah, eventually we got married in 2013 and I joined her in the church where she was stationed in Tembisa in Gauteng. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, so she yeah, was in charge. Started of, out in the in the Salvation Army then. Yes, we started out in the Salvation Army, and we then moved to Venda. Okay. Um, it didn't work out that well in Venda. There were a couple of issues, you know, with the churches. I think the the church as a whole in in in, in Limpopo in Venda particularly it faces lots of challenges, you know doctrine and theology and the way yeah. people understand the word of god and so yeah we we then decided to to resign from the salvation army and i actually worked for a year again in the army as a procurement officer while i was discerning if i want to be ordained as an anglican minister because i'd met bishop martin through the process where, you know when things were tough in Limpop, i met Bishop Luke and then Bishop Martin, who then say to me, I must join the Fellowship of Vocations. So I joined the Fellowship of Vocation as a minister of another church. <laughs> yeah, wow. How on earth do you end up in the Anglican Church? <laughs> yeah, so I think I was exposed to the Anglican Church in KZN in Nongoma. So my church in Nongoma was actually in a street of church, Main Street, they called it. And all the churches were there, Lutheran, Salvation Army, Dutch Reformed, uh, Anglican. And uh, I just knew the guys and the Anglican church was next door to me and spent a lot of time. I had friends and I really enjoyed the way they preach. <laughs> I enjoyed 
you know, the way they, 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 they tackle theology and some of the difficult questions. And yeah, so it was, it was easy, you know, to, 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 to join the Anglican Church. Mm-hmm. And I must say, Bishop Martin was really an amazing priest really got me involved. I became a lay minister all again from, you know, I started yeah. from scratch, uh, but I was fast tracked. In a year I became a lay minister and then became a deacon. And then the following year became a priest. And then he appointed me as a diocesan youth and children development coordinator, which is something I love. I, I think I really joined ministry because of young people. I have a heart yeah. for young people and a passion just to, disciple them and teach them yeah that's really exciting and you um you serve it as chaplain at wet pups at the moment as well as part of your role yes i serve as chaplain at wet pups and yeah that's the highlight of 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 my my week whenever i go there to see the young boys ministering to them and why i love young people is that they provide you an opportunity to be flexible in your ministry and look at doing things differently and yeah I really love that. Yeah, I think I think we get stuck in our ways often, and it's it's useful to have some younger people around to help us think a little differently and outside the box. Yes, I, yes. I've got a very soft spot for St John's, obviously, because that's where I kind of started my involvement with the Anglican Church with the with the youth there. Um, so uh, so I, that was part of part of my journey as well. What now you've you've stepped into a role and gone straight into lockdown. Um, what can we be praying for you and Kwesi and for St. John's at this time? I think it's just for God to continue giving me a vision, you know, of where he wants me to take St. John's. And I, I, when I arrived here, I sort of like felt God is calling me to do something about, you know, homelessness, mm-hmm. especially here in Weinberg. I see lots of people on the street and, and, and I want to do something. And yeah, if you can pray that God will really make this vision clear of how he wants me to, to help the homeless people. The one thing, I took a walk with, with Murray Bridgman the one day, just I think a month or so after I arrived, we did a prayer walk and he told me all sorts of stories and you know, gave me the history of mm-hmm. Weinberg and St. John's. And, and Murray can give you a lot of history. <laughs> It was fun, you know, and and then we stood uh, close to the library and and I saw all these churches in Weinberg, all in close proximity, but yet very divided. And and I also began asking myself the question, what role can I play to bring some sort of unity or, you know, something for the churches to do together in yeah. this space? Yeah. No, no, that's great. Thanks so much, Taban. It's great to have a, a brief intro to something of um, of your story and you and Kwesi. Um, and I've just realized you haven't mentioned the kids as well. Tell us about your kids. Yes, so we have uh, two beautiful children. I almost hate three. We have a, we have a dog. We have a dog. So <laughs> actually took the dog to the vet last week and on his uh, the prescription, it was written Champ Bengani. So that, that felt good. Uh. <laughs> So, yeah, we have two children, uh, Tendo, who's six. He's doing great R at Wet Pups. And then we have our daughter, Amuhelang. She turned three in April this year. And, yeah, uh, both my kids are born in, in April. So there was good, good planning there. Very well. <laughs> and three years apart. Oh, no, that's great. Anyway, so, Tabang, we'll hope to have you in person at CHS again at some point when... Uh, when lockdown ends, but thank you so much for sharing with us um, just a little bit of your story um, and where, you, where you're from. Can I just, as we close, just pray for you guys? Yes, yes, please. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for Tabang and for Kwesi and their kids, um, taking the big step moving down to Cape Town here and leading at St. John's. And I just pray, Lord God, for your presence with them in Jesus' name. I pray for Tabang for a sense of your vision and direction, Lord God, as he leads there. And we pray for your blessing on St. John's as a church community. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Tabang.
Hi everybody, <laughs> we greet you in the name of, of Jesus. Uh, we can't see you physically, but we sense you spiritually as we come before you to um, reflect. Firstly, we're reflecting on more than just a hundred days of shutdown and um, knowing yeah, that we passed that and we have no more we don't know how many more days ahead of us we're still going to be in this situation. Um, we have been reflecting on God's grace over the last week or so. Personally, we have been in uh, self-quarantine after being told that our daughter, one of our daughters and sons-in-law, had tested positive with COVID and we had had exposure to Sarah, our daughter, and her kids about two weeks ago. And so therefore we decided to self-quarantine until uh, yesterday. And uh, with no symptoms, they seem to be doing okay. But it did give us some time to remember about God's grace, that God's grace is enough for us. So as we do uh, that, we've come a we're reminded of, of some scriptures that we have and the first one that I'd like to read in terms of grace is Romans 5 verse 1 which reads Therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand and we realize that God's grace is miraculous. It allows hearts to beat, bodies to heal, and love to be given, regardless of people's opinions of Him. He offers forgiveness to the rebellious, freedom to sinners, and intimacy with Himself to all who trust. Christ is Savior. God's children can approach Him confidently because there is no condemnation for those who belong to him. What amazing grace. And that reminds us, we have received many video clips during shutdown from all different sources, friends and family and connect groups that we're involved in. And one of the week, many times we've received, uh, sung by different people, amazing grace. And uh, one of the paragraphs or verses that rings true in terms of grace. It reads, through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. So um, now we shall we all move into a time pray. of prayer. Let us pray. Let us pray. Um, Lord, as we join together this morning as the body of CHS, we want to be so much more aware of your unmerited favour, which is grace, in all aspects of our lives. We thank you for an example of this church service this morning, that it's been possible that we have we've got together with all the modern technology. And we'd just like to bless all those who have worked so hard to have made this morning happen. And Lord, it's also by your grace that CHS has been an alive, living and growing community during this period of uncertainty and shutdown. And it will continue to do so. And we would like to lift up Brendan and all the leaders of our and every, all the leaders of the church and their families to you, that they may have um, peace, protection, and your guidance in daily affairs. And for all those who need extra support, whether with sickness or financial burden, or fears of the unknown, and other troublesome areas, we stand by you as um, and intercede, knowing that our God will hear our prayers 
and through you and your and through, by his grace will meet all your needs um, and all the people in our country in the essential services we would like to bring them to you Lord whether it's medical educational um, the farmers transport the cleansing department we pray for their vigilance and for your protection Lord, please guide our the leaders of our country they have a big job to do and we just pray for wisdom and guidance and peace that they will lead us safely we pray this in jesus name lord you have showered your grace on us and this has encouraged us to, to persevere to the end and to die in faith we continue to continue to pray that we will believe because your grace is sufficient and guarantees our perseverance with joy in our hearts.
CHS, I hope that you all are well. Um, today's reading is from Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. To the church in Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Greetings, CHS. Thank you, Brendan, for inviting me to preach, to be part of the sermon series on the seven churches in Revelation. And let me just say, this is the first for me. I've never been invited to preach to any church online. And so, yeah, a wonderful experience. But I do look forward to a time when I can physically come to CHS and be able to share God's word. And hopefully today's sermon is good enough for you to invite me physically to your church. But thank you for this opportunity. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Holy Spirit, help us to see the things the way they are. Holy Spirit, help us to be who you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So today we are looking at the church in Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 13. Philadelphia was the sixth of the seven churches to receive a message from Christ. Now the name Philadelphia means brotherly love. It's a name given to it in honor of Attalus II because of his loyalty to his elder brother, Eumenes II, King of Lydia. Now, I must just say this two names are very difficult for me to pronounce, and I'm glad I can do it in the beginning and not be able to refer to them again. The community was built in a frontier area as a gateway to the central plateau, of Asia Minor. Philadelphia's residents kept barbarians out of the region and brought in Greek culture and language. And in AD 17, this city was destroyed by an earthquake. And aftershocks kept the people so worried that most of them lived outside the city limits. Now, geographically, the city is located about 40 kilometers southeast of the city of Sardis. So this was the youngest of the seven cities whose churches are addressed in this letters written by John. Originally, this church was originally founded as a missionary outpost. So who was this church? What's so special about them? So one of the things about Philadelphia was that it was a strategically located trade town in Asia. It stood between Rome and the Eastern world and was known as Little Athens. This was because of the many gods and idols. But although it was filled with idolatry, this church remained faithful to Jesus. The church had little power, as Jesus mentions in the letter. They also faced persecution from the Jews. 
which we see in verse 9. But despite weakness and opposition, they trusted in his word and remained faithful to Jesus. In a world filled with idolatry, they listened to Jesus alone. And that was their greatest achievement. As the church, friends, I believe that this is our call today. To listen to and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, despite opposition and challenges that we face in this time. Especially in this time of uncertainty as we face this pandemic, this coronavirus. The scriptures must be the centering point of every Christian and the church of God alike. Now, out of the seven churches, only this church and the church in Smyrna received unqualified praise and approval. They deeply pleased Jesus. This is the church that delights Christ. And so John gets instructed by Jesus to write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now, are the angels of the churches in Revelation chapter 1 to 3 real angels? Or are they human messengers? I have to be honest, I've always struggled to understand this. However, the meaning of the angels is less plain. Because the Greek word angelos simply meant messenger. Usually the word that was used for supernatural messengers from God. However, sometimes the word was applied to human messengers of God's word. John the Baptist was called an angelus in Matthew chapter 11 verse 10. Now some biblical scholars interpret the angels of Revelation 1 verse 20 as heavenly beings. Others view them as the human messengers who bore John's letters. Others identified them as those who actually read the messages to the congregations. For example, people such as pastors, elders, or bishops. A pastor of a church functions as a messenger for God because the pastor delivers God's word to the congregation. Now, if the angels of the seven churches are heavenly beings, then that would perhaps mean that each church had a guardian angel or some type of heavenly being associated with each congregation. There is difficulty with this interpretation. But what we do know is that John was writing letters. Why should he write letters to angels? Were the angels going to be, were the letters going to be read to the congregations by celestial beings? That's highly doubtful. But a better view is that these angels are envoys sent to John. John, we know, was exiled on the island of Patmos. And so this could have been people who were sent to John to go and see and check up on him. And so these delegates could be the angels or messengers that were entrusted with the letters on their return trip to the different churches. So the letter kicks off with a description of Jesus in chapter 3 verse 7. Just as in the other letters, Jesus chooses to introduce himself in this letter in a way that has particular relevance for the Philadelphian church. So there is a uniqueness to this description. Firstly, Jesus describes himself as he who is holy, he who is true. What Jesus is doing is that he, re he reminds the church in Philadelphia of his very being because Jesus alone is holy. I want to suggest that by this, Jesus also reminds the church that they are, they are also called to be a holy people and obedient. Jesus continues to describe himself as he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and when he shuts, no one reopens. By this, Jesus shows that he's also 
the keeper of the keys. And in this quotation, Jesus expresses his power, his authority, especially to admit and exclude. And so let's dig in and see how Jesus interacts with them and why Jesus is so impressed with this church. What can we learn from the church in Philadelphia? And what can we apply to our lives as the body of Christ? In verse 8, Jesus speaks about the open door. Jesus says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied me. What does Jesus mean when he says, I've opened a door for you? Well, there are four things that I want to highlight about this church. And I believe this are good vital signs that show that this church is alive. These vital signs speak of the state of the condition that this church is in. And that is probably why Jesus praises them. And from this, we can learn and see that the church in Philadelphia is really a church that is carrying out God's mission in and out of season. Now, over the last couple of weeks here at St. John's Church, we have been speaking about God's mission for the church in a changing world. And when we began the series, this is what I said. I said God's mission is for the church to make Jesus known to people, to disciple people, to make disciples who continue to make other disciples. Now, I also say that God's mission never changes. However, as the church of God, we need to constantly be adapting and changing to the times we live in, in order to see that mission through. Now, I continue to say that in the future, the difference between a church that is on God's mission and a church that is holding on to tradition will be that the church that is focused on the mission will remain alive, but churches that hold on to their practices and models will eventually die. Now, having led different churches in the last 10 years, I've seen how churches behave whenever a bishop or special visitor comes. I've also seen how churches are packed on these occasions and how people try to be on their best behavior. Sometimes we put on a show as the church, but this church in Philadelphia didn't do that. They were themselves all the time, and Jesus sees that, Jesus recognizes that, and it is that that impresses him. Now, if you led a church, or if you are leading a church, this church in Philadelphia is the kind of church that you want to lead. Or rather, the letter that they receive is the kind of letter that a pastor would love to receive from Christ. I have seen you. I have seen how you've been operated. And I am pleased with you. So here's what caught Jesus' attention. Firstly, this was a church with an ability. So Jesus says to them, you have little strength, and he recognizes the little. The little strength suggests that the church had been subject to severe strain, but had not lost its vitality. It had been weakened many times, but it had not lost its grip. They persevered. You see, the difference between this and the other churches lay in this. Jesus saw the others weakening and losing vitality. But in this one, he saw life. He saw that they were trying their best. They were trying all they could to get to full strength. Even when they were surrounded by challenges, they never compromised their faith. It is precisely that little strength which Jesus still looks for in the church today. And this is the sign of ability. 
It's a basis of possibility, a sphere in which divine grace can hopefully work. What am I saying? Churches should not stop doing what they need to be doing because they face challenges and persecution. Yes, we may be weakened by some challenges in life. Yes, we will face difficult situations, but that should not keep us from exercising our faith. You see, even under extreme pressures, we can keep a little strength. The term little strength does not imply weakness at all, but real strength. You see, this church in Philadelphia was weak enough to be strong in the Lord. The problem with the church today is that we can sometimes be too strong or too big or too sure of ourselves for God to really use us. But this church in Philadelphia had the poverty of spirit to know that they really needed God's strength. It's not a matter of great strength, nor great ability, but great dependability. Samson had a great ability, but poor dependability. A little strength faithfully used means more than much strength fleshly and fitfully used. The Apostle Paul was a great example of this dynamic weakness and strength. God's strength was made evident even in his weakness. When Jesus looks at us today, does he see our ability? Does he see our little strength? Or do we simply give in to temptation or challenges around us? Or do we try so hard to be like other churches or to fit in in the world around us that we lose our identity in Christ? What is stopping us from keeping our fire burning? This church in Philadelphia pressed on even when it meant they operated with very little strength and Jesus noticed them. I would rather press on with little strength for the Lord rather than do nothing. Secondly, this is a church with an opportunity. Now the picture of the open door is one that distinctly indicates special opportunities. Jesus says to them, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. The church in Philadelphia has an open door set right before them. Now often an open door speaks of evangelistic opportunities for engaging in missionary work of the church. It is a special honor for the church to have such opportunities. This church is alive enough to do earnest Christian work. It is also alive enough to resist the influence of evil. So Jesus tells them that he has opened the door of evangelistic opportunities for them and they must go through that door in faith. In its history, Philadelphia had a great evangelistic calling because the city had the mission of spreading the Greek culture and language through the whole region, as I've said. And now Jesus opens the door to them to spread the culture of the kingdom of God through the whole region. I believe that sometimes God sets an open door for evangelistic opportunities in front of us, but we often don't see it. There is a story of a man who comes to faith in Christ. He's born again and he's baptized in the Holy Spirit and he's been touched so much by Jesus that he wants to do something. And so he goes to his pastor and asks how he could win others to Jesus. So the pastor asks him, what do you do for a living? The man says, well, I'm an engine driver on a train. Then the pastor asks him, is the person who shovels coal on your train a Christian? Well, I don't know, the man said. The pastor says to him, go to him, ask him, find out. And if he's not a Christian, start with him. Once we see the open door, we have to walk through it. 
And God wants us to take every evangelistic opportunity that he opens before us. But there may be another sense to this open door. You see, the Christians in Philadelphia seem to have been excluded from the synagogue in Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. And so the open door may also speak of the opportunity to enter God's kingdom in contrast with their exclusion from the synagogue. And the best part is that no one can shut this open door. The emphasis on this is unhindered, on this unhindered openness is that there is nothing that can keep them from their access to this door. Nothing can keep them from their access to salvation since Jesus is the one who opens and no one can shut. And it is Jesus who shuts the door and no one else can open. So Jesus has the authority to keep this door open for the Christians in Philadelphia. I believe that God opens doors for us especially for ministry in this time. The question is, are we awake to see these opportunities? You see, we have a role to play in our communities, in our workspaces, in our families, wherever we find ourselves. We shouldn't wait to be told what to do. Rather, go for it. The door has been opened. Thirdly, we see that this is a church with security or a strong security. Security is assured for this church in Philadelphia. We know that they have suffered previous hardship and persecution. So one might suggest that they might have been living in fear or they might have had trembling in them. Maybe they were discouraged too sometimes. And we know from our own personal experience that being a Christian and standing up for the truth in this world is not always easy. It can sometimes be a lonely place. Imagine how harsh it was for these early Christians. They had less security than we have today. Today, there are many of us and we can comfort one another. This was a church in the middle of a place that was filled with idolatry. So Jesus says to them, I can assure you or I am assuring you a deep security. Jesus sees it as an essential thing to offer them comfort and security. He makes them aware that all their hardship is not in vain. And in verse 10, I'll just read it for us quickly. Jesus says, since you have kept my command, to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come up for the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Jesus makes them this promise. In this we see how God is always faithful to his church. God always meets our needs and responds to us when we need him most. When we are in Christ, we are kept safe from our enemies. Jesus says to them, I will make them to come and worship before your feet. And in this, Jesus promised that he will always vindicate his people and make sure that the persecutors recognize that they are wrong and that Jesus and his followers are right. In this, God shows that he's always faithful. In this, God shows that he will always come through for his church. As a church, we don't need to go out of our way to prove that we are right or that what we believe in is the truth. Jesus does that. And all we need to do is to serve him and serve him well and faithfully. Lastly, this church was promised a sustained ministry. In verse 12, the main idea of a pillar speaks of something that is permanent. Their good work of missionary service will gain continuity and nothing will be able to stop the work of the church. Because of this, 
we see that we will always be rewarded for our faithful service as long as we use the opportunity given to us as the church. Now the ancient city of Philadelphia suffered from frequent earthquakes. When a building collapsed in an, earth, in an earthquake, often all that remained were huge pillars. So Jesus uses this to assure of this continuity. He offers the strength to remain standing. And what he's saying to them is that no matter what happens, whether the world around you collapses, if you are in me, if you are faithfully serving me, you will remain standing, even when everything around us crumbles. Pillars hold up the buildings. The only thing supporting the pillar is its foundation. Now, two pillars in the church support the church and they look to Jesus as their support foundation. Jesus says to them, I will write on you the name of my God and I will write on you my new name. The overcomer also receives many names of God, the new Jerusalem and the new name of Jesus. These names, friends, are marks of identification or new marks of identification because they show who we belong to. They are marks of our intimacy with Christ. These marks show that we belong to God. And friends, these are the marks that I believe we need to be striving for as the church of God. You see, for our work to be successful and sustained, we need to be grounded in Christ. And so as I draw to a conclusion, what do we take from this? What do we learn? For those of us who have little strength, the Lord set open a wide door. You may not be able to open the door, but you can enter it in his name. And once Jesus opens the door, any, no opposition will be able to shut it. And if Jesus shuts this door, no one will be able to open it. It's marvelous how much Christ can make of our poor lives if only we offer ourselves to him fully. The faithful church in Philadelphia was seen by Christ as a church with an ability. Even when it had little strength, Jesus still provided them an opportunity. He opened the door for them. He then offered them security. And this security saw their ministry being sustained. Friends, are we that faithful church? Are we the church that will keep the faith? And if not, what steps do we need to take? Remember this, we too have an ability, no matter how small we might think we are, there is an ability within us. And we too have an access to that open door that Christ opens. And when we enter through it, we will have his security. And with him in our lives and in all our plans, we can be assured of a sustained ministry. Amen. Creation calls, beckons me to see, beckons me to see. Creation.
Tabang for that message. Um, yeah, I found it really encouraging. Um, yeah, as we um, end off and go out into the week, let us just close in prayer. Father, thank you so much um, for your message to us today, Lord. Thank you for your words and your encouragement. Lord, I pray that um, we will be weak enough to be strong in the Lord. Lord, I pray that you will revive us if we are feeling dry and dead inside, Lord. 
I pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on us and equip us to be, um, yeah, to have that ability, Lord, to work for you. Lord, I pray that, yeah, that you will show us the opportunities and the open doors um, that you have opened for us, Lord. And yeah, Lord, I pray that you will give us the strength to walk through those doors and boldly proclaim your name. Lord, I thank you for the security that you promise us, Lord, the security that we individually and collectively have in you, Lord. Thank you for the promises that you have made to us and thank you that you are faithful and you are worthy. Lord, I pray that, yeah, that as we go out in this week, that you will sustain us, equip us and, and bless us, Lord, that we will be able to do your work and um, bless those around us as you bless us. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for, for your amazing strength. Amen.